Hello and welcome to the Mick Plus One podcast, where I sit down with industry leaders to discuss the project to product movement. I'm Mick Kirsten, founder and CEO of Tastop and best-selling author of Project to Product, How to Survive and Thrive in the Age of Digital Disruption with a Flow Framework. On today's episode, I'm joined by two very special guests, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, Vice President of Research and Strategy at GitHub, and Dr. Danae Ford Robinson, Senior Researcher in the Saints Group at Microsoft Research. It's an absolute pleasure to have them both join me on the podcast. Both Nicole and Danae are brilliant researchers and technologists who are pushing the boundaries of how we think about both the technological and the social aspects of how software is built. Danae holds a PhD in computer science, has interned and collaborated with many research laboratories, contributed to countless publications, and is also an affiliate assistant professor at the University of Washington. Nicole is the author of the Shingo Publication Award-winning book, Accelerate, The Science of Lean Software and DevOps, and is best known as lead investigator on the largest DevOps studies to date. We had a great conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. So with that, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Project to Product podcast. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Nicole Forsgren and Dr. Danae Ford Robinson here with me today. Nicole and I were having discussions around developer productivity, which we tend to do fairly regularly, and how to better measure it, how to better measure it in a way that empowers teams rather than doing uh, these big brothery things. It's, this is something that's been a topic near and dear to me since my PhD thesis. And Nicole actually introduced me to Danae, who it turns out we've been sort of living parallel research universes for all this time. Danae's been doing some incredible work studying open source communities, how inclusion should work at scale if you want to make sure that we get the best of the world's talent, not just a very small segment of that talent. So Nicole, why don't you tell us kind of how this part of the journey started? And then uh, we'll go on into, into some discussion. Yeah. So as you said, we were nerding out as many nerds do, right? Talking about how to measure productivity, how to measure systems, the right kind of measures to use so that we can empower developers so that these measures don't get weaponized against them. How can we deliver insights to teams and organizations? And I had just been having these great conversations with today and I was like, wait, hold on. We, we absolutely need to invite Janae to this conversation because Danae has been doing this amazing research for developer productivity, but not just productivity, but things like how can we think about measures and measuring productivity in ways that give us great insights to people, insights to our systems, and insights into the ways that we build systems and measures for ways that help bolster inclusion, diversity, so that we can build these better systems. And so, Danae was down for having more nerd conversations <laughs> and ways that we measure things better and give us better insights. Think about the ways that we build systems and what it tells us about all of these measures. So, Excellent. Well, yeah, thank you for joining this time. I'm really glad we're hitting record on the conversation because the last time we didn't <laughs> and we learned a ton. So, Danae, maybe you could start just giving us some of your, some of the research that you've done, some of the work that actually led to your thesis, your study of these open source communities like Stack Overflow, what got you in, interested in it and where that's taken you. Yeah, so I like to start off by always saying, like, I study the Yahoo answers for programmers, just because it's, and I mean that by every instance of the word, it can be a toxic environment, it can be very helpful, it seems like it's existed for so long. So I was really interested in how developers ask questions, or specifically how they ask for help, where are the help-seeking strategies they use in online communities. We know that some of those help-seeking strategies don't go as well in person, like such as classrooms, but what does it look like online where you can be anyone you want to be, right? You don't have to present it yourself. You have a little bit more control over how your identity is shared and how people perceive you. But there's some instances of being that vulnerable that still make people not want to engage. So I was really curious as to what communities that's happening in, how are people overcoming it? Because there are people who do contribute, right? How do we use those strategies of the people who are contributing to help the lurkers, who are interested, at least the interested lurkers. What mechanisms are they using? And then how can we use that to build interventions and design interventions that can be on platform, a part of the products? So I'm really interested in that whole three-step process. And a lot of those experiences started by answering the questions of the marginalized, right? The squeaky wheel gets the oil and we're seeing that there's a low of representation of women and, and other underrepresented minorities and people from different countries beyond the global north, right? So we're thinking about the global south and countries that exist beyond the US and beyond the UK, right? And beyond those popular regions we see for technical experiences. So 
I like to target the few and help the many. That's the way I like to kind of brand my research. So targeting experiences of the marginalized, figuring out how we can use those experiences or learn from those experiences to build and empower everyone, including these marginalized folks. Okay, excellent. And I think this is just such, I didn't think it's always been a timely topic. I'm glad to see it's actually getting a lot more attention right now. And I think what's happened with this shift of work styles, this is something that's on almost everyone's minds, right? Where it used to be that whether it was sort of office politics or office cultures would sort of adapt and have their own sort of diversity and inclusion problems. I've actually experienced some firsthand at some of you know, your research where you have these, my background's all open source, right? And open source projects have their own cultures and they have their own versions of inclusivity and exclusivity and cliques and, and these kinds of things. And the fascinating thing to me is as, as I've noticed the shift to more work from home, that kind of open source culture, which where you can have open and embracing cultures to contribution, to people asking questions and not being made to feel stupid because it's, they just don't have all that context that this inner circle's had for a while. That style of interaction, I'm actually, with, whether it's my company, the organizations that we work with, I'm actually now seeing that as become the more normal interaction model for development in large organizations. So I think some of those things that you learned and, and some of your research on how open, how inclusive projects are, we're seeing that manifest itself more than ever in companies today. So tell us a little bit, of, I mean, maybe just starting with the Stack Overflow. What were your key takeaways from that work? Yeah, so for the first Stack Overflow work, for the first one was identifying barriers to contribution. So we started off with understanding the challenges of women in these communities because Stack Overflow has their annual developer survey. And several researchers have done work in empirical studies on understanding who contributes to Stack Overflow, how, where they're coming from. But now a lot have done targeted work to figure out what's happening with this specific community. So we started off identifying the barriers of women and we interviewed about 21 participants, one of them actually being one of the top ranked users of all time. So that's really awesome. The reason I mentioned that is because we have the lurkers and active users as well, but we can figure out what deters the lurkers and how the that top ranked user of all time overcame those challenges, right? In fact, in that interview, that person mentioned that they had those experiences too. You know, they had a fear, negative feedback. They felt weary of the large, intimidating community size, but they were able to overcome it by thinking about how they can contribute and give back to the community. So more of a community service model, right? They felt like they got so much from Stack Overflow and they wanted to be able to pour back into it. And for whatever reason, that kind of superseded the fears. And they're all valid, right? But they were able to overcome those challenges they had. So we started off with those women. And then we decided, okay, well, these barriers exist. Let's see how they exist across the gender spectrum. And not necessarily like a gender dimorphism. Like, it's not like all men do this and all women have a challenge with this, right? We saw that all 12 of the barriers existed for folks across the spectrum and that everyone experienced these challenges. There were just about five barriers that significantly hindered women more than men. And in fact, using those barriers, we were able to build the Stack Overflow Mentorship Program, which was in collaboration with Stack Overflow. So I worked with Christina Lustig, Jeremy Banks is our developer on the team. Christina was one of the first researchers at Stack Overflow. So it was really awesome to see how Though that the work that started understanding, again, the experiences of the marginalized few, the less than 7% in the community, right, ended up being a feature that we built for the entire community, not just women, not just people from the U.S. And we, in fact, saw participants from Egypt engaging and figuring out how they're ident using identity to signal each other with something inspiring for understanding how we do this in other platforms like GitHub and Code Review, right, and how those who you are and how you present yourself can invite people to connect with you we can also be kind of a vulnerable thing to share. So looking at that dichotomy is something I'm really interested in and I'm, that's from the, the future of my work is going. Okay, excellent. And Nicole, you, know, you, you and I have been looking at measuring productivity in the organizations and sort of large scale DevOps transformations and, and so on. I think we both sort of intuitively get the sense that if you have more diversity, more inclusion, more ideas, more contribution, things are better. We also have all these stories of the opposite, right? Whether we've lived them directly or we actually think observe them sometimes through data, which is fascinating, where if you have one person who's holding the keys to the ivory tower of this part of the architecture and you have to take that person to lunch eight times to get any change made or to get your questions answered, well, that's not a great pattern. And it's even harder to take people to lunch now. For better I know, food. right? I know. <laughs> So tell us what's interesting to you about this, because I think we've seen these patterns and anti-patterns. We obviously are both big believers in the fact that 
Today's work is unlocking these amazing patterns for collaboration, for inclusivity, and for, for much more productive and healthy organizations. I think you and I probably do fix it on the anti-patterns and then study those more than we don't. But yeah, what did, tell us what's interested you about this work. I think I really love seeing the things that are similar in open source and the, some of the similar patterns that we also see within organizations, right? So it's really interesting to hear how Danae has found some of the barriers to participation in some of these open source and like open collaboration and knowledge sharing and knowledge seeking communities, or I guess that those are some of the words that I've used in some of my research, right? Because I used to do a bunch of knowledge management research. And so some of the things that I used to study were knowledge management, knowledge sharing from developers and sysadmins. And so we used to also look at knowledge sharing, knowledge seeking behaviors, because when we're working in complex distributed systems, finding ways to make our systems work can be really hard, right? And so what happens when we have people who are asking questions and looking for answers and lurking, but also value lurking, right? Because sometimes contributing can be tricky. And so sometimes mm -hmm. we lurk because that's the safe way to interact, right? That's the safe way to understand. So one of my early investigations found that there are about four archetypes or profiles for how sometimes people interact with we called it a knowledge base, but it wasn't really, right? It was how you can search similar server profiles or how you can search for tickets or how you can search for knowledge bases or how you can ask each other questions. And that these were, I'm going to say, okay, right? Because historically, many people thought that you either asked questions or you didn't. And if you didn't, that was a fail. That's not necessarily true, right? And it sounds like Danae's kind of saying the same thing. Once you kind of accept that or make it okay to lurk and learn, maybe... Right, then like, learn. I love that. You can learn. That's exactly what she Lurk and learn, yeah. Yeah. Right? You can lurk and learn, and it's kind of okay because sometimes we take notes in our own post its or pieces of paper, or we talk to each other and it doesn't show up in our systems. Right? Like, there is no artifact for that knowledge transition happening. What can we do to help support and bolster and create these? situations and environments so that it is safer to share because sometimes you have to lurk a little bit. Sometimes you want to lurk just to see how people communicate. And then you can move forward and understand what the norms and behaviors are in the culture. Exactly. And that's what the mentorship experience was strictly about. Helping the novices. We had other 70,000 novices. People were like just entering the help room, check in, and they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to check out actually, not me. Right. Yeah. And like ultimately we ended up, there was a whole cup of filtering that happened, but we had over 520 novices enter the room. I think only 347 talked to mentors because think about it, the people who have, maybe they've had negative experiences or they've seen others have negative experiences on the platform. And they're kind of like, well, I'm not sure if this is going to be anything different. So before I engage, yeah. I want to make sure this is a safe space. You all are branding it as this. Let's confirm that. You know, yeah. let me see how you respond to others. Let me see how people are finding value. Maybe then I might feel comfortable taking the leap, right? So it's about learning those norms. Yeah, lurk, learning, and norms. I really like this lurk and yeah. learn. I had it right, <laughs> like a brown bag lunch. Like a lunch and learn, lurk and learn. Yeah. So we've seen similar things, right, in terms of communication, collaboration, knowledge sharing. And then what does that mean for... I mean, as we kind of tie it back to, sorry, I got super excited about what Danae had been saying, back to productivity. Yeah. If we want to think about productivity and software development, what does that look like, right? When we think about the signals that we see in our systems, sometimes that'll show up as a push or a pull or a commit. Sometimes it won't, because if I've just talked to someone, that won't show up. If I jumped on a Zoom meeting, that might right, depending on how we're tracking those measures. Or sometimes if we're doing peer or mob programming, it might show up on one person's commit, but not another's, right? And so we want to be kind of careful about what it is that we're thinking about. There's also some really foundational work that Lucy Suchman did years ago about making work. The title is called Making Work Visible, but it's about invisible work. Mm -hmm. It's about there are the incredible work that so many people on our teams do that doesn't leave footprints, but as soon as they bail, as soon as they leave, like go on extended leave or vacation or something, everyone's productivity, for whatever definition of the word we want to use, tanks because they're the ones that do the glue work. They do everyone's rubber ducking. They do everyone's, and it's not just, you know, not that administration work isn't important, but 
they do even sometimes a super, super technical rubber ducking for everyone that might not leave exhaust. My experience with this was I started lurking and learning as well on open source projects I was sitting in on. And I did notice that this, to me, was a pretty interesting realization. I think it's coming kind of full circle right now where if the only way you have of, of lurking and learning is by reading code and looking at pull requests, it's not enough unless you already have a lot of that context. But I think that there's this assumption often, be it in open source projects or, or in large organizations, that's sufficient. You figure it out. If you want to, you know, you want to, you need some API extensions, just go, you know, give us a pull request and, and go from there. And it's, as you said, Nicole, like, you know, you can actually find the right sorts of things. If you've got, Danae, some of what you're doing, if you've got the kind of right program to engage you, I absolutely have noticed that those projects that have that in open source, they thrive much more, right? They, they just draw more contribution. It's just, as you said it, by making their work visible, their workflow visible, and then their conversations and collaborations visible, you all of a sudden open yourselves up to a, to a much broader community of, of potential contributors. And I think, again, in, in the shift of everyone moving into this, it's, it, it's just not sufficient to be talking and everything over Zoom and so on. So what have been your experiences today with how to help that within both open source projects and, and really help organizations think about the right, what, what kinds of things have you been doing more recently, building on the past work to make it easier to you know, sort of incrementally engage and get people contributing, committing, and, and really increasing the, the diversity and design of, of the software. And I actually want to get, then get this to the point of architecture, because I think there's this incredible thing that when we don't have it, architectures just degrade into what you just described, Nicole. So like one person's got, knows everything, they leave, and you're now rewriting the entire platform. Whereas in healthy organizations, you have that diversity in the architecture, you have a way of onboarding people onto it, it's very different. But yeah, Danae, I'd love to hear your experiences on this front. Oh, yeah. I was, I was just going to actually add to that, like the transparency is important, right? right? So something that I've worked on since like trying to transition from Stack Overflow to GitHub is understanding how newcomers engage in the Q&A, but also how Nicole was talking about the like, knowledge sharing, the information foraging. Where is zero? Like, where do I start? Mm-hmm. Right? And it's about being transparent about how to contribute being explicit about how to contribute. Where do you draw your guidelines and what you will accept? What type of pull requests you're accept- expecting? What What does a great merge pull request look like? Give me an example, an exemplar of what does not make it in, right? Figuring out where to draw those community guidelines, right? I think we talk a lot about that in other social media platforms, but I don't think we get as concrete as we need to be as for our online programming communities. And understanding that, that transparency and being, making governance explicit and have have different rules for these communities and have them stated and, and posted where everyone can see them and allow people to contribute and then allow the rules to evolve over time as people become new contributors to the to this space. So I think a lot of my work has been really figuring out how these different rules shift for each community, how people are sharing them, how they evolve. I know people like Amy Zhang are looking at really interesting new governance models of how online communities accept merges and accept adjustments to these rules. I think she had this paper at WISC called Policy Kit, and it was talking about how people do these types of conversations and like democratic situations of when people are sharing knowledge and evolving rules, like how we do it in the U.S. democracy. Well, why don't we do that for online communities, right? How do we get people to vote, right? Why is it only one maintainer who gets to accept or merge this pull request in, right? There's a dialogue that happens, but ultimately it comes up to one person. How do we get more intentional about that? So I think I, even a lot of the talk I gave on Wednesday, I ended on this idea of being intentional about identity, but it was also being intentional about rules. Make governance explicit, like I said. Be welcoming. Have guidelines on what this looks like. And I think understanding like how different open source projects and other communities are doing this, we can learn a lot. Just even belong beyond our open source communities, belong beyond our online programming communities. People got it right. Maybe we could figure out how to adapt that for our, our work. I love that point. The point about making it explicit and transparent for what it means to be part of a community and speeding up and accelerating that onboarding process, I think is so important and so interesting. So several years ago, I actually did a study with Debbie Fields, the Scratch community. And so kids doing, doing work on Scratch. And I love Scratch. A, uh, right? It's so, it's so great. It was a very simple analysis using NLP, semantic analysis, and it was how kids communicate 
differently when they're talking about their scratch projects versus when they're not talking about their scratch projects. Mm -hmm. And so even kids, like young, young children, I think they were like five to 10, five to 11, their communication patterns are statistically significantly different when they're talking about projects versus when they're talking about other things. So our software community norms significantly differ depending on what we're talking about. However, which shouldn't be a surprise to us, right? We know this. But if that's true, even among children in software, even a children's open source software platform, how long did that take them to fall into those norms? And the faster we can get people to go from lurking and learning into accepted and feeling like they're accepted members of the community, I think is huge. And will really break down those barriers to, to, to your work and your point, right? Yeah, yeah. There was something else I wanted to hit on there. Was, and you kind of highlighted the difference between how we talk about these communities. When we're talking about professional, our technical work, right? And we're talking about the details, right? And then we have our personal, or when we're talking about maybe more social aspects of what film may have influenced, what variables you're using in your code, right? And different characters like that. And I wonder why do we have to keep them separate? And I feel like some people do blend them. And again, this comes in when you think about, I know like, for example, as researchers, we write papers and we get personas. I know for me, I like to use personas from film, culturally relevant ones. Oh, I watched this show, like Scandal. I want to include Carrie Washington in my, as the characters in my paper, right? I'm making analogies to policy because I like those types of films, right? That's a part of like bringing our personal interests with our technical interests. And where is the overlap? Some people do find value and feel comfortable and find authenticity in that overlap and bring those both to the, to the fore. And I wonder if there's like a different type of just different personas of developers, of those who oh. like those intersections and like to present them, others who like to keep them separate. And, I, and this is, maybe this is a talk conversation about a future study or something. I know, see, do, but... we have these conversations <laughs> and we end up like designing studies. I will say like these kids absolutely overlapped. So when they were talking about projects, Scratch projects, for people who don't know Scratch, it's kind of drag and drop, but you can build these amazing things. But they were still giving them feedback and interesting things about projects, but they were ridiculous projects and it was fun. But then like they would go off and they would talk about slaying and like crazy ridiculous things. And I think the latest thing was cats or something, right? But you could tell when they were very excited about a project, even if the project overlapped Mm. and the other one when it didn't, it was slightly, slightly different. But the language format slightly changed. And I think it was because they had fallen into the norms of group communication. Trust me, their personality was there. I want to find this paper and share. Yes. <laughs> it, yes it, please. it was great. Oh, and it won a Best Paper Award. So, like, the community is, is interested. People still want to study this. It was great. Yeah. There's now, so now we have there. to do a study here. Yeah, we do. We <laughs> do. So there are, I know like GitHub does sometimes these hackathons that some developers at GitHub just get, do post some fun things on Twitter. And there was this example of someone saying, oh, well, I'm pinning my photos. I could pin my photos to my favorite pinned repositories now. And people were like pinning mm-hmm. photos of their children. So now this is an explicit call of like yeah. intersection between your personal and professional identity, right? So what is, maybe there's a difference between the developers that want to bring all of them to their technical work, right? Versus those who don't. And those who found maybe there's comfort and confidence in having for both those groups, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. This is something that I've always, is this, is really Stay tuned, everybody. Yeah, stay tuned. (laughs) Stay tuned because it's really interesting. So, but then you see, and you mentioned something I think, which is along this theme is, and some of your research that to me was, was really interesting and just had not occurred to me. And it was just a lot of learning for me is just, with online personalities, with remote personalities and so on, as, as you just mentioned, as being intentional by identity. Mm-hmm. And so can you, I think this is something that, that is going to be you know, quite new to people, but can you say what you've learned about them? And I think that bringing your personality to it, bringing your culture to it, it is key there. And there's a, another kind of control and flexibility that you can have when with, with remote work and with distributed work. So, so can you tell us a bit more about that? Actually, there's so, there was like, 
two things there. Okay. So, so for the bring your identity and figuring out when you want to have the intersection in 2016, 17, there was this, I like an engineer hashtag movement. It's identity based hashtag movement, right? Where it was started by Isis Ankeli, who was a developer in the Bay area. And she never had a Twitter before. She had a very weird scenario with a, with a colleague or someone around. And she was saying, they, they said to her, you know, you don't, you don't look like an engineer. She was like, what are you talking about, right? And so she made a Twitter, encouraged by one of her mentors. They said, you know what, you should just share it. And she posted a picture and said, I like an engineer. And it was important to note that she implicitly implied that there are other intersecting identities. Actually, she explicitly said it later on in the blog post, let's be clear, right? But the fact was that I'm trying to break stereotypes, right? I don't want other people to feel like this. I don't want other people to feel like they don't belong. And what was interesting about this identity-based hashtag movement was that the intention was to have others engage. It started off as just a woman. And then she was like, well, there were mothers, like young mothers who were sharing this and Latinas who were sharing, Latinas in computing. So they started seeing these intersecting identities and people intentionally sharing these on their technical platforms. So in our interviews and in our analysis of the Twitter data, people were saying that, you know, I was weary at first and figuring out how I should share or talk about these very personal identity factors or facets in these technical spaces. But there was empowerment, right? People being the only one, the shared only oneness. I'm not really sure that's always, that's always called it that, but being able to see that you can be your whole self. You can bring your whole self to your technical work. You can be the engineer and also be a soccer player, right? Or you could be the engineer and also be a nuclear engineer at NASA. And we saw those interesting stories. And so that was something I did with uh, Laura Dabish and Fannie Lou at CMU at the time. But it brought this idea of like, why can't this happen everywhere else, right? The fact that this even had to happen to break a stereotype, why isn't there already a norm if you can bring all those authentic experiences, your personal experiences, the rest of your identity to your technical work? So the idea of like, how do you share that in technical spaces and how people, your peers receive that is what the challenge really there was. Like, how would others receive me now that I'm also, I'm being explicit about my identity. You can see who I am. You can see that I'm a woman. You can see that I'm Latina, but now I'm explicitly saying it. I'm not trying to make a political statement, but I'm, I'm saying that I am who I am. And I'm also this too. And I'm just really curious to how it looks like in the technical space. But then when you mentioned remote work, it makes me think of how people bring different flavors of the identity in the current pandemic, where ways to do that are like people showing their dogs that show up now. They're like, oh, yeah, I'm also a dog mom, or I'm, I, I'm also a farmer. Here's my tomato farm during their coworkers, or people show different parts of their identity. Like, I'm an artist. You see that I have sculptures and pieces in the back. So now you see my uh, explicit part of my personal life because you're in my home. Like, you're able to just view, right? But you're also obviously here for the technical content, which is why we're even having the technical conversation. Like we're at work, but you can see my home life explicitly. And I think with this pandemic, we're seeing people being a little bit more authentic. We're seeing some people sharing a little bit more of themselves where they feel comfortable. And it's about providing like space, like a safe space in order to do that. But there's other ways people are doing that by posting fun backgrounds, right? Or fun family photos. Yeah, there's my child, they're in the background here. and. I'm hoping that this creates even more authentic expressions of people's selves in, in work settings beyond like this is post pandemic I'm hoping for. I think it's happening a lot more now. I'm looking forward to what it looks like, you know, in hybrid work settings and how do we empower people to do that more later on? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember when it first happened and, you know, so we, we've always been done a lot of remote work, but right, I think around the third of the company was remote, so we were sort of used to it, but then all of a sudden, two thirds of the company's not done this, and they're all they're worried that the kids are there, that something's wrong with their background, or that their head just jumped in. And I think the value of bringing that authenticity is so key. That when first I just sent an email to the whole company saying, well, "Your kids should be walking into the picture, and <laughs> just get them to yeah. say hi, and, and that's okay now." Do you think then, and Nicole, I'd love to get your perspective on this as well, is that with this just massive shift to the type of work that you've been studying happening across the industry, like we're talking about tens of millions of people in technology who just change the way that they work. You've had all these insights on making your identity explicit, intentional, tailoring it to you know, yourself and your persona. A, do you think it'll get better in terms of acceptance and understanding and inclusivity of different identities? And B, is there, do you think people will start behaving differently, be, becoming more intentional around it? I think in some ways, some of this 
inclusion of whole identities has been, I don't want to say a surprise, but like maybe a little bit of a surprise for some people, because for a long time, I've always heard, bring your whole self to work. But for so often, that has maybe unintentionally been said by white men, right? Because so much of tech is white men. And then suddenly, so many people were bringing more of themselves to work or like maybe not, right? So, so for much of my career, I have not brought my whole self to work because the smallest details from my past have been weaponized against me, which is strange, right? I'm from a small farm town in Idaho. Somehow that was weaponized against me. It was very strange. So for many of us, we have not, right? Because when you ask people who are underrepresented or marginalized or vulnerable populations and you ask them to essentially be more vulnerable, like that's not, that doesn't always work. And so when tides shift in some ways, right, and you now bring your whole self to work, it can suddenly be surprising or jarring or something, right? And now you're like, I am here and I'm fabulous in many fabulous ways, right? And it has been, yeah, like maybe jarring for a lot of people who were not, who were the majority and were not prepared for this onslaught of fabulousness, <laughs> right? And it's like, <laughs> you've been talking about your entire life and now the rest of us are going to be talking about our entire lives because we have this wealth of exactly. great things that we can talk about. And now that everyone is working from home, it's like, no, I did not have this invisible family or invisible children or invisible pets. We all have all of these things, right? And if you want to talk about it, you can. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. But like you said, right? Sometimes there are pets that jump in. Sometimes there are children that jump in. We can all say hello. Or if you don't have pets and if you don't have children, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to. But if you are in lockdown for five months now, six months now, that isolation can also be very real, very difficult, right? So that may also be part of your whole self. Which right, is having a conversation about that. Yeah. 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 yeah that, I think that, that's so interesting because I think it, it's in an awesome time, it's, it's very easy to bring yourself if it's, you know, if you bring yourself with, you know, more talk of baseball or bro culture and that's, that's the office culture. But exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's like, I, I don't want to talk about golf. Golf is dumb. <laughs> Tried playing. It's like so boring. I'm yep. sorry for anyone who loves <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. I really I'm love you. About, <laughs> I want to talk about Beyonce. You know, I want to talk yes. about Lemonade album. Right. And so it's, so By the way, that that dissect <laughs> series on Lemonade is incredible. If you haven't listened to it, man. hey, you're bringing your whole self to this podcast. Cute, cute to the <laughs> listeners. Cute to the listeners. Beyonce. Yeah everything that's period period that's me bringing my host up saying period but nicole hit on a very important point like in the beginning of that which was the weariness of what the space already looks like right which is for so long it's been like yeah you can do this there wasn't really the space was a space and it wasn't really safe right and when you brand a space as being safe and it's not really that can be really scary for people trying to be vulnerable Right. And I know that participants have explicitly mentioned that in conversations before in our interviews. And I think it's important to think about that as well as we move to hybrid work and what it looks like for the future as well is that it's about creating opportunities for everyone to be able to feel that comfortable and being receptive to that, to all the differences. So the differences that make us unique, but also the shared experiences within that. Right. Maybe it's not Beyonce. Maybe they're not all Beyonce fans, but they do drink lemonade. Boom. Now we can have a conversation about lemonade. Wow. There's a shared experience. You know, that's a very playful example, but I think we can really, we may hopefully see just a shift in our workplace setting. So, I really now do hope this happens, right? Is that people are sort of have been forced to bring themselves more because of just the environment. And that's, that could actually just change the culture of, of being less homogeneous because people are being, especially if I think people take some of what you're saying, which is become more intentional around it. Because I think, well, and so Danae, do you think this is now an opportunity for people to become more intentional about their identity in how they engage with organizations and their teams? Oh, yes, because people are already doing this online, right? So when yeah. we're thinking about, I guess, I think this is actually a lot of the findings that I've had from previous studies, they can actually apply more so here because thinking about online we have our avatar images that aren't necessarily an image of our like our human face right they could be cartoon characters they could be cartoon images or be nice a picture of my and, cat. and our filters 
be nice to right. us in our filters. <laughs> right, right. And so now that, in, but that's what we had on online, right? We have our avatar images. And when we go into the workplace, we don't have, it's not the norm for us to walk around with avatar images over our human faces, right? But now that we're working remotely, if we don't feel comfortable sharing our video or sharing our, our image, we don't have to. We can turn off our cameras. We now have all the same control or similar versions, comparable versions of control that we had in open source communities. We can just turn off our camera. If we don't want to chat, we don't have to talk to our coworker down the hall. We'll just log out. We'll close the computer. We have control over how we share our identity and how we engage with our colleagues a little bit more now. So that's, I hope that answers your question, but that's why I see things going. I think they're comparable. I think there's this rise, a setting for more research to be even more studies to be conducted, more interventions to be tested out now, because again, some people call this a great work from home experiment. And there may be opportunities to see some of those pie in the sky interventions we hope to try out in open source, what, figuring out what they would look like for the population of not, that are not developers or the population of developers that are not on open source, right? I think it also gives us some really interesting opportunities to think about how we want, to your point about controlling our image or controlling mm -hmm. uh, access. It also gives us, I think, some really interesting opportunities to control some of our time, right? In some ways, I love going to the office. There are some things I can only do with other people on a whiteboard, <laughs> right? Like for some reason, whiteboard is my magic. But sometimes, as much as I love people, sometimes people, right? People. Like, people. I need a oh. break. <laughs> I need a minute, right? I need to close a door and think. I need to get some deep work done. I need to think. Yeah. And I love people, but I also just need y'all to leave me alone. Right. I cannot get things done. And working from home, I can close my windows. I can close my browsers. I can turn off all my notifications. And I can actually concentrate for hours. And yeah, this get is, your deep work done. Yeah, this is not possible in an office because everybody, again, I love you all. I feel so bad. I sound like I'm such a meanie. But everyone wants to stop by and say hi and get coffee and no, leave a girl alone. <laughs> Got things to Working. do. Yeah, I can get hours of work done. I can figure quote, I can disappear for a few hours. Right. And it's magical. <laughs> and when we think about productivity, yep. getting into a flow, getting away from interruptions, that's huge. Whenever, to your point about like the great work from home experiment, what could we all do if we all had uninterrupted time? Right. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the getting and staying in the flow. And I think that, again, for me, I know it's certainly early in my career, but it's still, you know, continuing to learn about this. And I've, you know, learned a lot from, uh, from both of your work. Yeah, I think often technologists or, or some technology leaders and managers assume that, that, you know, that work really is just about the technology stack, getting onboarded, getting the environment set up. But I think what we're seeing right now in this great experiment is just how important to, to getting people productive, happy, and growing, how important the social fabric is. And I think the, the really neat part to me about the intersection of both of your work is, is something I was, I was really interested in early on as well, is this socio-technical congruence, right? That if you have an effect, let's say, you know, you start out with some kind of technological software architecture, code base, and so on, people have built it, evolved it over time, and then if you exhibit some of the success patterns that, that you've seen today, that architecture actually evolves to allow people to stay in their flow, to make great contributions, to do great work. But that only really happens if you have sort of enough diversity and new people being onboarded into it. And to not only have that learning and the working is happening, it's actually changing the structure of the software. And I've done this visualization I did of a bunch of open source projects where you could actually see the number of contributions happening and the overlay on top of the software architecture. And when there were more contributions, be they you know, pull requests or just questions being asked or, and not code, I would never study the code being updated, right? To me, the, the interesting thing was that conversation, not the code. Mm. So the more conversation that there was around this code and the broader it was, the more the APIs and the architecture would evolve. What I, you know, what I realized is that you can actually measure that by, by looking at how much flow there is in terms of evolution of the architect, architecture of delivery. So there's this amazing thing that happens when, you know, you can align, you know, your org chart is evolves to actually support some kind of inclusion and growth and getting new people to contribute and new ideas to contribute and people who see the market, the code design customers differently. And then when your software can evolve into that. So maybe Nicole, can you tell us a bit about what you've learned? Because I think a lot of the, 
the symptoms that we see, such as kind of like the Brent scenario from the Phoenix project that you outlined before, but their organizations will have these things that they're blocking that, right? They're blocking evolution because let's say they're blocking flow with some of your earlier work on continuous delivery. If you can't have a flow to the market and a feedback loop, your architecture is not going to evolve because you know, what's the point of evolving anything if it takes six months to deliver something? Yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences and what you've learned in terms of what it takes to evolve technological architecture to support people's best work and people's best deep work? I mean, there are so many things. Yeah, it's an easy do. question. Don't worry. I know. <laughs> Start anywhere. Really, what it comes down to is optimizing for the right outcomes, right? So if we want to make sure that we find ways to develop and deliver software so that we can deliver value, as long as we're starting there, then we can kind of work backwards. And by working backwards, I mean, think of the things that are going to contribute to that. When we say developing, delivering software to deliver value, that usually means focusing on speed and stability because if we can ship software quickly and with stably and reliably, that gives us good outcomes. And for six years, we found that speed and stability move together. That gives us better outcomes. It means that we are releasing code that doesn't have a large blast radius. It has lower likelihood, lower probability of causing an error. When it does, it's going to be easier to debug and find the error, right? So as we work backward from that, that's where we have a big, it depends, right? Depending on what your organization looks like, depending on what your architecture looks like, depending on what your processes look like, will tell you where you should start or what you should focus on next. So, and that's just kind of going to be a constraints-based method for debugging or identifying what comes next. So it's going to be probably <laughs> complex and a big hairy ball of mud, but very often we see it's going to be something like a change approval process, right? Because change approvals, particularly in large organizations, are bureaucratic and slow and hand wavy, right? So anything that introduces delay is going to introduce instability because it causes batching up of work. Anything that is tightly coupled is going to be causing lots of communication, handoffs, whether it's tightly coupled architecture or tightly coupled teams, right? If you have to coordinate something with 12 teams, it's going to be really hard to get anything done. And it probably also means you have to be communicating and coordinating things with lots and lots and lots of technology, whether it's a monolith or a mainframe or both. Really hairy and messy automated tests or build systems are, are many times the same thing, right? And many of those things Mick, you're probably keying in on a lot of this, is also going to probably cause you to not have visibility into any of that. It is going to be causing you interruptions in flow as well. Because if any of those things had visibility into the flow, someone would be able to look at that and say, oh, fix that right there. So anywhere in that flow process where it's easily visible, very, very transparent, you can see what's happening, you can see the delays, you can see the handoffs, you can see the the interruptions and the problems, you can fix it. So those are usually the biggest things that we tend to see. And in terms of, if we kind of tie a bunch of this <laughs> discussion up at a bow, when we think about productivity, either at the team, individual team or organizational level, when we think about measuring things and optimizing for outcomes, right? Tying things end to end and optimizing for teams and diversity, we tend to see much, much better outcomes if we have a lot of different inputs through the system, right? As opposed to people who just sort of, it's always been done here. Yeah, so here's another, you just gave me a study idea. Which yes. Work right now. But I bet, I, anecdotally, I can attest to this for better or for worse, but more diverse teams actually produce more decoupled architectures, more cohesive and less coupled architectures, which produce faster flow and better outcomes. Because, and I have absolutely seen this within TASTA, on our own teams, that when we had teams that were not diverse enough, you would end up with one type of overly rigid architecture that was you know, created by, whether it's by the smaller inner circle or by groupthink or for whatever reason. I just wonder if we now could actually have enough data to do, start doing this on this measurement, that you end up with better software architecture with more diverse teams, with better inclusivity to bring 
more ideas and yeah and, i'm trying to think of like the teams and the organizations that i've worked with and that i've seen and anecdotally that seems that's matching up at least from the teams that i know yeah and then a bunch of the work of course that you did nicole is to show that the architecture is a bottleneck to flow just like lack of automation is yep. a bottleneck to feedback which is a bottleneck to flow which is a yeah. bottleneck to you know everyone being in being able to, you know, to contribute to meaningful outcomes. And the thing that I love, like you're mentioning flow, right? It's a bottleneck to flow. And the thing that I love about this is that it ends up, it's almost counterintuitive, but it's not, right? And it's interesting because when you think about it, even in terms of culture or psychological safety, the first reflex is so often people to be like, oh, well, let me build a team that all looks exactly the same because then we're going to talk the same. It'll just be faster. And it's almost the step 0.5 shortcut, because if you all talk exactly the same, have the exact same background, have the exact same education, have the exact same training, if you've got the identical A, B, C, D, E, F, J, then things will just go faster. And you're like, sure, you won't have friction. Yep. It'll look similar. Your first step one to two will be the same. You'll get the incredible immediate short-term yes, benefit. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's how people fall into it. Yeah. Right? But as yes. soon as you get to step two or two and a half, you're going to start having troubles because you can't think of what comes next. As soon as you start having troubles or shortcuts or you need to brainstorm or you need to do something, you don't have that injection of what looks different. Because right? you so, all and, sound the same and you all yeah, are thinking the same. You think the you same, same, you sound the same, same, same you talk the same, you, same like, you wear the same shirts, you do the same hobbies, right? So like all of the inclusive, diverse research shows that even things like brainstorming studies you insert one or two people that look or sound or like have different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I think they have double output. And so it's like, yeah. if you pay that tax up front, you'll pay a tax where like you figure out how to like Beyonce, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you you do that storming forming, I know that those aren't, that's not the preferred. That sounds, that sounds right like an official name, storming yeah. forming. Forming, storming, norming, performing. I think there's a five factor model that's slightly better. People like a little more. So if you pay that upfront slight tax, then long-term your growth is way, way, way better. Yeah, and I think it's also important to note here that you're, when you're talking about diverse teams, we're not just talking about gender, ethnicity, culture. We're talking about backgrounds. Right? Yes, yes. Even thinking about people from different large, like big R1, big popular universities, right? And people from liberal arts colleges, right? Who are thinking about yes. the intersection of so many different types of fields and how the software you're building can impact, right? And I think, I'm so glad you brought that up, Nicole, because there's also cognitive diversity, right? How people think, how people share the knowledge, the analogies yes. that they use to represent concepts. And those all contribute to how we build software. Right? How they ask questions, how they think about problems, the questions yes. they ask and how they yes. phrase it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our, even our in this discussion, right? Like we're each asking different things and we go off on these like crazy tangents, which, sorry, these like bananas tangents, because that's what helps us think about something in a totally different direction. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing to me because I, I think I understand this and then something happens. I realize just how little I understand it. So the, the, one of the recent things is Nicole Bryan, our chief product officer, she brought in interns from the Ann Richards School in Austin, which is a, a school that helps young women get into colleges from a, you know, a lower socioeconomic status. And they were participating in our meetings and asking questions. And it, it just completely, you think it'll make you think a little bit differently, but just bringing that framing to not just me, but, but a whole bunch of other leaders was, was just amazing. So, so hopefully this is now an opportunity to do more of that. I think, Danae, you know, you're pointing out that I just really hope that one of my conclusions from the podcast is that this is the time that I think we can embrace this, put the systems in place, make learning and lurking you know, as prominent as having commit access to code, right? Yes. And just build in these things that you've learned that I think, Nicole, you put this really well. The things that you've been learning, studying open source, now all of a sudden matter to like every technology company on the planet. And they should have mattered before, but, but <laughs> they really matter now. So maybe just- In case you wrap... missed the memo. <laughs> <laughs> but just to wrap up, any, any recommendations for how leaders out there should be thinking about this, how they should be- getting started, what they should be doing in terms of, you know, both sort of small next steps, but also the, the kind of bigger vision that you have. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we kind of said it earlier, but I guess one point I would add is that there are opportunities for like this overt diversity, equity and inclusion work, and then this covert 
diversity, equity, and inclusion work, where we can be very intentional and say we're going to build equitable systems to support this community, right? Like affinity groups and empowering this small group of Latinas in computing, right? But it can also be that, that, so that's an example of like explicit, right? And then it can also be, well, we're going to create a space where we're going to give time for people to share their perspectives from these different regions. And we're going to be responsive to turn our closed captioning so we can be accessible to our developers from who are new to the English language or just don't have, who are deaf, right? So we want to be able to think of inclusion in different ways and how it can empower others. So a good example of this is like curb cuts. Although they were people with low vision, they helped people with strollers, people pushing carts, right? Skateboarders, right? And I think we think of when we're thinking about building systems and really creating safe, diversity, equitable, and inclusive spaces, we should think of it like that. Like we can target the few really, and but most likely we'll be hoping a lot more, so the many. Yeah, and I think that is just amazing. Like, you know, like you said, targeting the 7%, how many yeah. people you end up impacting at Stack Overflow? That I think that that is an amazing statistic and picture. I, I really want people to take away from this. Like you said, Nicola, you may be paid a bit more upfront on the storming, but then when you get to performing, you've got a much more better, res- robust, and resilient result. So, yeah. Nicole, any last thoughts as we wrap up? I think I want to build on some of that. I really like Denise's framing about thinking about the few and how it applies to the many. And when we think about things like productivity, right? don't necessarily be so myopic in trying to optimize or be 10x or 100x on productivity. Really take a broad, wide picture, right? And thinking about engagement is such a weird word, but what are the different ways that people can interact with the work that they're doing? And think about what that means and value it for what it is, right? So we talked about lurking and learning. That doesn't mean that it's not valuable. It doesn't mean that they aren't using your platform and you have to force them to engage. Value it for what it is. Think about it for what it is. And then also find ways to possibly lower that barrier or just say, this is dope. The fact that they are here watching is amazing. What are other ways that we can get people just to lurk? Because this could be incredibly valuable. And then think about the several other ways that people could be watching, observing, learning. You don't only have to be actively contributing or asking or anything else, right? Find several different ways that people can be contributing, value that, and find ways to amplify and shine spotlights on many different ways that people can work with your code. Thank you both so much for everyone. Check out the resources, the the follow of Nicole and Danae, their research and, and their work. I'll certainly keep doing the same. So thank you so much for sharing all of that, all of that wisdom with us. Thanks, Mick. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to both Nicole and Danae for joining me on this episode. For more, follow me and my journey on LinkedIn, Twitter, or using the hashtag Mick plus one or project to product. You can reach out to Danae on Twitter at Danae Ford Robin and Nicole at Nicole FV. I have a new episode every two weeks, so hit subscribe to join us again and please make sure to follow the researchers. There's some amazing work that they're doing as well. You can also search for Project to Product to get the book and remember that all author proceeds go to supporting women and minorities in technology. Thanks, stay safe, and until next time.